his brothers kept things going. I remember one time during the Mardi Gras time, a daddy used to rehearsal every Sunday, all the different hymns, for he had different students he would teach. He would teach the guys at the blind school. He taught a couple of blind guys how to play uh, music, saxophone, clarinet. And he would uh, have different students come to the house on Sundays, and we would rehearsal all the music during the week. So when Sunday come, we all would sit down and play these hymns with this student. And uh, Martin would play the trumpet, Augur would play the trumpet, Clarence would play the, uh, the alto, I would play the tenor, my dad would play the alto. And uh, sometime, my Uncle August, my Uncle August Lenoir, would come over, and he lived across the street in Main Alberta. He'll come over sometime and play the bass, and we play these hymns. Sometime, uh, my Uncle Clarence will come over, and uh, he play the piano, and we be still playing the different hymns. This would go on every Sunday at my home in New Orleans. So, during the Mardi Gras time, where there was no musicians available to play the job, my daddy decided he got the job to play for one of the one of the uh, one of the big uh, Zulu, not the Zulu, it must have been the, uh, uh, I can't think of the name of it, it was one of them big organizations that has a big band all the time during the Mardi Gras festival. So he would, he decided he would take and uh, rehearse the, all of us on some of the heaviest marches that the other band would not be playing. And uh, so he, we got I, uh, a young boy played trombone, can't remember his name, and my brother August, my brother Martin, my brother Leonard, myself, and my daddy. And he, and he brought these uh, heavy marches like Gloria. Gloria was a, a, was a type of march that uh, it was, we were, he, the trumpet player had a very, very hard part to play, and the clarinet had this part to play. My brother August, and my brother Martin and we would play this glory and they used to go and that was one of them heavy heavy marches that daddy wanted us to learn but it was so we would practice every day before Mardi Gras and uh, so when we and then we had my brother Leonard he was the one that he could hit all the high notes so when we start playing music like Lady Be Good and uh, uh, Who Threw the Whiskey in the Well, or one of them two, uh, 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 Down by the Riverside, Down by the Riverside, all them type of tunes we would play. And uh, my dad would know that when he want them high notes to be played, Leonard would hit them high notes. All of them be playing like uh, Hunter Sunk Row. Uh, no, uh, and we get them with high note, and then we hit them high notes for them, and Martin and August will play the duets. So that went on. So when we got out on this particular Mardi Gras day, all the bands were playing. So the guy was saying, here come many down there with all them kids. What they gonna play? They was all one what the kids gonna play. So Daddy went over and he told us, he said, come on, boys, now it's time for you all to show off. He said, we're going to play Gloria. And man, Daddy had the drum boom, 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 and kicked that Gloria off. And we went to, they, they thought the playing that Gloria. And the clarinet, I had my clarinet part, and, and we had to play, all the moves. Planet runs and thing. And all them all the musicians came around, they were so astonished to hear all this young kid playing so well. Eventually, when Percy did come home, he found a place with Herbert Leary's Society Syncopators. Leary used two bassists in the then current Duke Ellington style. Percy also led his own band at a new club, the Moulin Rouge. I have to look in the paper, the Times Picayune paper. And I saw well, this nightclub wanted a band. It must have been about 9, 30, 10 o'clock at night. I went out to the French Quarter and said, let me look in this place and see what it's like. I walk in there, 
And I say, I see you advertising for a band. He said, you got a band? I says, yes, which I didn't have a band. <laughs> he said, well, get your band together and bring them out here. I wanted him. I said, we'll be out here tomorrow night. He said, no, bring them out here tonight. So I got to thinking, now, who am I going to get on this late notice? So I said, well, I know I could get my brother, Clarence, one on the piano. And I thought about Manuel Cruz on trumpet. He's playing now with the Preservation Hall. You may have seen him on commercials. He used to do a commercial for Rice and Rice, playing his clarinet at the Preservation Hall, him. And the friend, he said, well, we could get Jack Lamont on Trump on our saxophone. I said, well, the man want us right away. I told him I got four pieces. Good, I got Irene's car. And I went and picked them all up. And we went on out there. So we play, I said, well, we play about three or four numbers, let the man hear what we can do and get out of here. So we played three numbers and was packing up. The man ran up back and said, where you going? I said, we're going, we just played enough. He said, ah, oh, you got the job. I look, I said, well, let's sit down and talk money. So he said, play, we talk money after you get off. He didn't have no show. I think that night he must have had about, oh, maybe eight or 10 people came in the club. So we talk, he says, now I'll tell you what I'm gonna do. He said, I'm gonna get a show in here. I says, a show. I said, what you gonna do, go to the palace and get a show? Nope. He's come back here tomorrow. When you come here tomorrow night, I'll have a show. He went over in Mississippi, and he got four girls from over off a carnival that was held up in Mississippi. Kathleen, Irene, Irene, Kathleen. Oh, it was four, I can't remember all the names now. I'd have to look through some of my books. Oh, Penny. It was one of them, that's three of them. And so anyway, he brought those girls in, and I talked with them. I said, well, what you gonna do? He said, first thing they said, all we do know how to do is walk across the stage and take off our clothes. That's all they were used to doing. So I asked them what type of music they wanted. They said, well, you always play something sort of weird, you know, a lot of tom-toms in it. So I had a big tom-tom. I used to double on a tom-tom with the show on some number when they do their bumps and grind. <laughs> Here, after that night, they did all right. We had a bark out there, and we got quite a few people in. So oh, man said, now I want you all to have a rehearsal tomorrow during the day. Well, I got the fellas, we come down for the rehearsal. We sit down and say, now you in here. We got one rule in this place. What you do in here, you're right. Anybody else not affiliated with this place, it's wrong. I don't care what you do. Say, now I'm gonna get a bunch of B-girls. A B girl, these girls sit around, they're hustling drinks, and they get, okay, that, then they were charging a dollar ten cents for a drink, for a regular whiskey and uh, water, or whiskey and coke. The ten cents was for the waiter, 50 cents for the girl, 50 cents for the house. That's the way those B girls went. When he did hit the road again, working with Don Redmond, Danny Barker, and Jay McShann, things changed back home. Brother Martin moved to Detroit with his family. Little Charles, who had already become popular in New Orleans, was one of the last to arrive. I left New Orleans and I came to Detroit. It's 1948. I came to Detroit in 48. I think it was 48 or 47, one of those two. And uh, I got involved with a lot of musicians here. But the most the funny thing I can remember was my brother Leonard. Leonard, I was in, my brother Arthur was always telling me how to play the different thing from Lester Young because I loved the Lester Young, and that was my that was my thing. I like to play that type of music, 
And uh, but I was playing Illinois Jacket. I liked Illinois Jacket. And Illinois Jacket was making all the money, so Uncle would come and tell me, "Come on, baby, sit down and and ooh in the horn and ooh in the horn." And this time he'd take the horn and play on the horn himself. Ghost of a chant, do 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 do, and ground the horn on. For me, could play a little saxophone too, August. But I was hooked up on Illinois Jacket. So I was practicing one day, and then it came in there. And he said, uh, "Hey boy, hey boy, so what you doing? Say so you want to play with Lionel Hampton?" I said, "Yeah, but Hampton was working at the Paradise Theater. And he working at the Paradise Theater, and." Uh, so it was Fat Novell in, in the band uh, and all those cats, but I didn't wasn't too much aware of what was going on then. So he said, "Look, get your horn. I'm taking it down. Let you play with Lionel Hampton." So, but it did. Well, what happened? He left, and we went on to the Paradise Theater. So we got down to the Paradise Theater. Leonard knocked on the door. Pop, 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 pop. And man peeped out there and looked and said, "Who is it?" Leonard say, "Where Lionel Hampton? Hey, hey, hey! Where him? Where him?" The man said, who are you? He said, Leonard said, I got the greatest saxophone player in the world out here. Now, I'm, I got my horn in my hand like that, you know. <laughs> what you tell the man like that? Leonard got the greatest saxophone player in the world. He said, tell him, I got the greatest saxophone player in the world out here. So the cat went back and told him, he said, they got a guy knocking on the door outside. He said, he got the greatest saxophone player in the world. So he came and said, open it up. So he opened the door and let me come on in. So I came on in behind the stage. And him looked at me and said, you play that? I said, yeah, I play that. He said, take it out. I took my horn on out. So he went to the piano, line of hand, went to the piano, and he said, blow. So I thought the blowing teeth for two. I knew all them songs from New Orleans. My daddy taught me all them songs. And Hampton thought playing the piano with the one finger. And I thought the playing teeth for two. I kept on playing. He thought the playing. We thought the jamming. Me and Lionel Hampton. So he said, you will play my band? I said, yeah. Well, I was already up on top of playing like Illinois Jacket, you know. So when that laid on, so when we went back to the stage, he called me out to start playing flying home. And I was about oh, 16 years old, I guess. I jumped in front of the band, and I, and I knew how to play the horn upside down behind my back. And I thought the plane like Illinois Jacket, and by me being such a youngster, the house really got a, a big, a, a big a kick out of that. So anyway, I got involved with Hampton, and Hampton started the Junior Bebop the band with uh, with uh, Lou Claire Rockamore, Clarence Beasley, uh, Pippa Adam, uh, Bob Pearson. And myself, and I, I can't remember who, someone else. However, we started the uh, Lion Hampton Jr. Bebop Band here in Detroit, and, uh, but that didn't last too long. Hampton was but a beginning for Charlie. He got into a Latin kick during the mambo craze and traveled with his own trio. He was band leader for Joe Simon and worked with Aretha Franklin and J.C. Hurd. Lately, he travels the world as a member of the original Camellia Jazz Band. While he did this, his father, Martin Manuel, and Uncle Percy were not gathering cobwebs. I got a four-piece group together. It was playing weekends at small clubs around Detroit, River Rouge, E. Coos, Jackson, Ypsilanti, Ann Arbor, playing. I did a lot of work with these name acts used to come through, like Four Tops, Dinah Wash, and all, I played along with them. They had dancers, and they were in there, so they had to have somebody to play the dance music for them. Then, one Sunday, a fellow I knew from out of uh, Larry Russell's band, that's the band, that big band that Armstrong used on the road quite a bit. We call him Deacon Jones. He said, Joe Norris told me that you was here and I should talk with you. He said, now I want to go back into music. He had also had an Austin head operation. So he said, but I got to have somebody who know how to play in New Orleans jazz and Dixieland. So I said, well, who you got working with? He said, nobody, just youth right now. 
So I said, well, we get us a little four-piece group together until you get your stomach back. You can blow like you want. And then we'll work from there. So after he got, then he could blow his horn like he used to. I got my brother Manny on clarinet. Well, we call sax carry on piano. Ted Merriweather on trombone. Reap the Mallet on drums. Myself and Jimmy made up six pieces. And I went down to St. Leo's church and talked with the priest there, because that was my church. He said, yeah, you could use the bass when rehearse. So we rehearse one night. And the next week, he says, I got a fellow who wants to hear the band. So he had, had the manager of a hotel over in Toledo to come over and listen to us. And he hired us right on the spot for two weeks. We stayed in there 76 weeks. <laughs> a couple of years. That's right. And during that time, Ben went to uh, New York World's Fair and all. So finally, Jimmy got too sick to play. When he got too sick to play, as I was the one who got the band together, I took the band back over. Under my name, I got Charles Victor Moore to play. And on piano, I got Jay Gosen. And I kept the rest of the fellows as is my brother, man, and, you know, uh, 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 Merriweather and uh, Drums Mallet. And it stayed like that until Drums Mallet died. Then I got Babe Borders to play. Uh, later on, Babe Borders got sick on drums, so I got Bobby Neal, who is still with me. And my brother died, and I got Ditto on clarinet. So Ben, I could have been operating since back in the 60s early 60s, and here we are in the 80s, and still some of the same men playing right together. It's almost 90s. <laughs> <laughs> well, the fellas are all well-seasoned. They're up in age. Charles Victor Moore is formerly out of the McKinney Cotton Pickers. He's been playing trumpet since he was 10 years old. And now he is 81 and can still play. Ted Merriweather, he's 81, and he's still playing. Ditto is 76 on clarinet. Bobby Neal, he's 67. John Alexander, he's 60, about 68. I'm still kicking around here. I'll be 74 my next birthday. So everything's been going along beautiful with us.